The life of David, it is the um, detailed record uh, in scripture. So we know a lot about him. And one of the important things that we should know about David is nothing miraculous actually happened. He didn't experience the parting of the Red Sea. He didn't see the stopping of the Jordan. He didn't see the 10 plagues or see a dead guy rise up. Uh, he didn't see a disease being cured. There was actually, if you really read it, uh, no serious supernatural miracle. The only close event that we could really actually um, come out from uh, David's life is uh, slaying the giant, right? But if you really think about it, it could happen, right? Um, slings are very strong. And uh, even in Judges, um, or some other uh, records, we see that some of the men actually use that in war. So it's, it's probable. It's not a real miracle. The real miracle of David's life is that in this ordinary life, if you want to call it, of no miracles, his heart was set toward God. And I think that's a good example that the David story shares to us because not everybody goes through miracles each day. But if you want to really think about that, the real miracle that God has given to us is in this ordinary life that God has given to us. If we have a heart like David, if we have faith like David, that is the true miracle. The true miracle is that we believe that God intervenes. God is here. God is present. God works through us in our ordinary life. We've gone through David and Goliath, the greatest victory. We also went through the story of David and Jonathan. Okay? And I highlighted that we need a Jonathan, we should be a Jonathan, and this David-Jonathan relationship is not temporal, but eternal. And that relation is given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let's go to chapter 25. Now we have David and Abigail. It's, Abigail is the name of a woman, and it's a very detailed story in chapter 25, but if you read the rest of the story of David, you know, her name is just uh, not that significant. But why is this story so important? Every story is important, but why is this story important? Well, in many ways, in many ways, and we will see why. Today's chapter, if you read through all of it, um, has three main characters. The first is, of, of course, our hero in faith, which is David. And then you have Abigail. Okay? But she had a husband uh, named Nabal. Okay? And he was very, very rich. If you go to the first part, in the beginning, um, verse 2, a certain man in Maon who had property there at Car Carmel was very wealthy. It doesn't start out with a name. It just starts out with a rich guy. He had a 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. So it just describes that he was very, very rich. In the kingdom of God, we want our names to be written in the book of life. Not described as somebody who was rich, who was very fashionable, who was very strong, who was very pretty, uh, who had very much influence. We want our name on it. The Bible describes Nabal's name was not that significant enough to be recognized first. But it just says, well, he was a rich guy. His name was Nabal. And what's funny is his Nabal, 
Nabal means a fool. I mean, who would name somebody, right? Your son as a fool. Some people think maybe it was a nickname that was given to him. But the Bible says his name was Nabal, a fool. And his wife's name was Abigail. And the scripture describes her as an intelligent and beautiful woman in contrast to her husband. The meaning of Abigail is significant too, so I'll just bring it out uh, right now. It means Abi, means my father, and the rest of the part of her name means joy. So uh, my father is my joy, okay? So have that in your mind. You have a fool and somebody who's saying, my father is my joy. They're together. They're together. They're married. Well, it was the time of shearing sheep. And in those times, it was a festive uh, period. So there were a lot of food, a lot of drinks, a lot of merry partying going around when they were shearing sheep. So David, you know, he's a wanderer. He's uh, escaping from the claws of Saul, uh, from death. He's living in the desert. And if you have been reading uh, through Scripture, um, David, uh, he gathered his own gang. It started out with 400 weak people in debt who were, like, suffering in life. But they gradually became to be uh, warriors for David. And now he had about 600 followers that he had to lead. And, of course, if you have a large group, if you are a leader, you always, always want to have a good place to stay. We're hiding from Saul. We're always going around, and we always, always need food. So he's thinking, look, this rich guy, uh, why don't we just tend his, while the shepherds are tending his sheep, why don't we just guard him? You know, we'll, we'll just give some uh, good uh, actions toward him. Uh, so, so we could protect uh, the sheep, the goats, all the shepherds from thieves or evil people. We'll just protect them. And that's what David did. So he thought, you know, since I have offered this protection that, you know, if you are rich and we are just 600 people, he, we would get something. So he sends out about 10 of his young men. Why 10? And if you send one person, he, he could only bring such, right? So you bring a large group, meaning, hey, we want all of our 10 young men to bring a lot of stuff um, to the servants of Nabal. And uh, the servants said, well, yeah, these guys have been protecting us, and Nabal's response is like such. And we'll go to that. Nabal answered David's servants, verse 10, uh, 11, in chapter 25. I'll read this. Who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. That's what he's saying. Okay? I don't know you. He did know David, but he's saying, hey, I'm for Saul, not for you. I don't follow you. I don't serve you. You're an enemy of the state. Why would I serve you? And I hear rumors that servants are breaking away from their masters these days. And that's, of course, regarding David. And he said, why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to the men coming from who knows where? Okay, this is like an insult to David. Now let's see how David responds to that. If you were David, how would you respond? Okay, cool. Okay. We'll just move on or what, what would you do? Well, here's what David did. David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word, word by word. Okay. And in verse 13, David said to his men, 
put on your swords. Okay? So they put on their swords and David put on his. About 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. Now, there's another scene where the wife of Nabal, Abigail, hears this story from the servant and he heard what happened. And she was like terrified. She was terrified. And the story goes from there where she prepares a lot of food, so she's going to offer it to uh, David's gang, okay, without her husband knowing about this. And today's scripture that we read is right after she was going to David and they was coming down with his gang of people all armored and they were just about going to Nabal's house and kill everybody, okay? David was like... The, he, he's literally the Avengers. He's, he's going to avenge. He's going with his whole gang. He's going to just kill everybody. Okay? This is David. And he said in verse 21, It's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the desert, so that nothing is, of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. You know, I'm going to slay him. Abigail meets David. And if you want to take a glimpse of David's heart right now in verse 22, let me read this. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. I mean, this is like in the story of David, this is like the meanest David we could see. <laughs> this is all puffed up, angry David. His eyes like fiery red. He's going to pull out his sword to anyone, you know, who challenges him. He's like all like punishing death, all of these characteristics of David. Yeah, we could go back to the question that Nabal asked. Who is this David. <laughs> Because he's so different from chapter 24 and chapter 26, which I'll preach about next week. He's so different from chapter 24. Do you know what happened in chapter 24? David, he was hiding from Saul, you know, with his men. And one day, Saul's there. They see him. And Saul had to go to the restroom, okay? He, he had to relieve himself. The scripture says. And then David, he was in with Saul in this cave. And he, he had every opportunity to just kill him. But he didn't. Conscience was in his heart. I, I, I can't do that. He is still God's anointed. I can't put this matter in my hand. I will give it up to the Lord. That was what he did. So he just ripped a piece of Saul's garment. And he, he was so struck in by what he did. All his men say, this is the day that the Lord has given to us. Saul has just given to us. This is God's will. Just kill him and your kingdom will be established. But David said, no, 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 no. It's God's war. It's God's kingdom. I am an instrument. I will not take matters in my own hand. I'll give it up to the Lord. He will decide. He will raise the one, the true anointed. And he will destroy the one that he sees wrongdoing. So David pulls back. Chapter 25. What happened to this David? What happened to leaving all the matters up to the Lord? Where did this anger come from? Where did this fury, this uh, death raging emotions come from? And then we have Abigail, and thus the story. 
Abigail saw David, verse 23. She quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, My Lord, let the blame be on me alone. Please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. May my Lord pay no attention to the wicked man, Nabal. And she goes on. And eventually, after her speech, what does David do? He was a killer. He was an avenger. He was raged. He was the punisher, whatever you want to call him. In verse 33, after Abigail's short message, this is how David responded. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. He suddenly said, hallelujah. This is the point that I want to make. We all need an Abigail. Last week, we all need a Jonathan. But... We all need an Abigail. Abigail stops our fleshly ways, our ways that have no room whatsoever with God, the Holy Spirit, points it out in wisdom and humility that it brings out the best David inside of me. If there was no Abigail in chapter 25, God may have not chosen David to succeed Saul. He may say, I got the wrong guy again. Because David exists no more, if Abigail didn't step in, David would have become Saul. Who is Saul? He was the anointed. He was the God-blessed person. He was given the mighty kingdom of our Lord. But he took matters into his own hands. He, he, he used worship so that he could take it into his own hands to manipulate the moving away, run out soldiers. And he wanted to use it. He wanted to take matters always into his own hands. And he thought he was doing it for the Lord. But the Lord points it out. No, you are doing it for you. You are never doing it for me. You are doing it for your kingdom, your dynasty. Not my kingdom, not my dynasty. Not to fulfill my will, but to fulfill your will, your picture, your vision of what the kingdom should be. That's why Saul was rejected. Now, David, you know, until now, he was doing good. You know, even in the desert, you know, he, di he didn't complain. Well, he did in the Psalms. You see, he was in pain. He was in suffering. But he was always clinging on to the Lord, and that's what helped him to come back, always to end each sorrow, each pain, each psalm into what? A hallelujah. Praise be to the Lord. It was always coming back to the Lord, asking him, kneeling down to him, weeping in front of him that made him the David of who he is right now. When it was a matter of Saul, he was conscious, yes, this was about the kingdom. Yes, 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 he had conscience. His conscience okay, didn't let him do evil. He took matters not into his own hands, but gave it up to the Lord. But think about this. This is Nabal. You know. And David, he's a leader of 600 men. They're hungry right now. If it was about only him, you know, he could praise the Lord. He could like fast or pray or make some hymns or do something. But now look at 600 men. They have families. They have children. There was a heavy burden on David, and there was a chance. Okay, let's help this rich guy. And probably, you know, an average rich guy, if you're protecting him, we're like uh, volunteer, like guard, bodyguards for him. If we do that, yeah, he'll give us something at least. 
Wouldn't that be in David's heart? Nabal, who had nothing to do with the kingdom vision. Nabal, but he was influenced to what? The fleshly desires. Eating. Living. So David's heart kind of switched into his fleshly David. Now, I need food. I need provisions for my 600 men. Nabal has it. Okay, I have a plan. Let's just volunteer to become his bodyguards, personal bodyguards. He didn't ask for it, but we'll do it. Okay? I'm David. I'm supposed to be king. You know, if I'm doing this, I'm very humble. And I showed goodness to him. Okay? And I'm just going to ask him very nicely. I'm not going to say, hey, hey, I did this for you. You give it to me. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm a king. I'm an anointed guy. I'm humbled. I know who God is. I'm just going to ask, ask him nicely. But when he was rejected, and he thought that his plan is not working, and he, in his mind, he sees these 600 men grumbling, and all the families attached to these men. And, and thinking that they cannot eat right now. You know, you know I, I can't take this. I can't take this. So his fleshly David took the better of him. It is Abigail who comes, who stops David, who makes him think makes his mind aligned to the vision of God again. See this woman of wisdom, you know what she says. In verse 26, Now since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm my master be like Nabal. She is doing a prophecy here. Nabal is not dead yet, but that's what she is saying. Be like Nabal. What? Nabal's what? Currently, he's rich. You know, if you read uh, uh, scripture, he's having a party, he's having a, a life. But after 10 days, Nabal is going to be struck dead by the Lord. She knew this is going to happen. And also that David would listen to her. The Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands. She believed that after she finishes her talk, David's not going to do what, he's supposed, what he wanted to do. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm my master be like Nabal. And she said this, this is my gift. I think the worst part of who we really are comes out when we are confronted in the essential necessities of life. If it's about eating to live and I do not have that. If it's about love that I need and I do not have that. It's, if it's about money that I need and I do not have. And I'm, I'm just, you know, pa being patient about this until I can endure it. Then we just break. The worst of the worst of who I am just comes out. Abigail keeps on going. She says, the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master. She's bringing up the promises that were already given to David. She's bringing that back again. She's aligning uh, David's mind with the vision of God. The Lord, because he fights the Lord's battles, 
David, you're not supposed to go about killing people like Nabal. You're supposed to be a warrior for the battles of the Lord. You pull out your sword in God's name. You pull out your sword to establish his kingdom. You don't pull out your sword so that you can avenge somebody who hurt your pride, who hurt your current situation. David, you are a kingdom fighter, not a fleshly fighter. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. She knew who David was. He was a shepherd. And it was when he was a shepherd boy that he was called to the grand vision of God. God called him to lead his people like he tend his sheep. And he's using shepherd vocabulary. What is the bundle of the living? Well, in those days, shepherds, you know, when they're caring for their sheep, and it, there were so many, they don't know how many they have, right? They could forget easily. So one sheep, one stone, one stone for one sheep, okay? They will use that and put it in a bundle, okay? So in that shepherd bundle is the amount of the number, the same number of the tending sheep, okay? So the shepherd knows how many he has when he has this bundle of stones in him. And it is the bundle of life because he will, the shepherd will, tend the sheep with his life. And if it was David, he did tend it with his life, Right? So she's using that uh, vocabulary and then uses something else. If the stones were in the bundle, it was secure, it was protected. But if the stone was in a sling, a pocket of a sling, it will be used to hurl away and defeat the enemies. And it was talking about David. David, you know who you are. You're a protector of God's people. You know who you are. You're a defender of God's people. You fight God's war. You fight Goliath with a sling, with a stone. That's who you are. Abigail goes on. When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him leader over Israel. My master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. This language of conscience that was used in chapter 24, okay, as uh, he cut off a corner of Saul's robe in chapter 24. I'll, I'll read it in verse 5. Afterward, after he cut off the corner of Saul's robe, David was conscience stricken for having cut out off a corner of his robe. And then he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord." She's using the exact word that he felt in his heart, conscience stricken. My master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden. So she, Abigail, she's bringing back who David, the real David, the godly David, the anointed David. And David realized this. He comes back. He snaps back. And he says to Ab Abigail, praise be to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, when I look at this, I'm in awe. I'm in awe. How many times that when we are angry and we are like driven to just 
do something, just cry out, shout, and just like fight when we hear true message delivered. How many times do we just, okay, hallelujah, thank you. How many times do we do that? We just do it. <laughs> like the Nike, Nike label, just do it. We just do it. This is what distinguishes David, who is so different with Saul. Saul, he, hers, he also had many Abigails at his side, but he never listened to them. David, he listens to the word of God. That's what makes the difference. That's what makes David the David. And this is my challenge to you. Do we have an Abigail? I think we do. I think we do. I, ha I think we have many Abigails. The reason that we are not living a life of victory is, is because we are not responding to the message given to us through Abigail like David is doing. So many times, our temper gets the better of us. It should be God's word that drives us. It should be the spirit-guided guidance that leads us to our every response. And I think scripture is saying to us very clearly Saul and David, they were all weak. They had their fleshly desires. They wanted to take things, matters into their own hands. But one listened to Abigail, responded, and was brought back stronger. But one slipped, never rose again, and was going toward the end of life, which was death. It's interesting, after Nabal is eventually struck by God and killed, David calls Abigail and makes her a new wife, okay? So she's uh, wedded to David. <clears throat> and I think this symbolizes something very uh, important here. Like a wife wedded to the true anointed, the Holy Spirit is always here. He prays for us, enlightens our heart so that we could open up to hear the word of God, empowers us, always with us, like a wife. But only the true wise and the faithful hear the word, respond to it, and live a victorious godly life where others, like Nabal, even though right next to that person, Abigail was there. And I do say, since she was intelligent in wisdom, that in every opportunity she had, she would have expressed the will of God, what God intended for Nabal. But Nabal never, never listened to Abigail and eventually lost her as a true wife. Scripture says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Meaning, I'm the center of my life. 
Therefore, I take matters in my own hand. But they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. I conclude this story. We all have a n a b i g a i l Either we end up as Nabal or we end up as a restored David. That's our choice. I pray that the Holy Spirit, when speaking to us, we will listen like David. It's not that David is different. He doesn't experience anything wrong. He doesn't experience these fleshly desires. No. It's the immediate obedience to the word of God that makes David a true David. Brothers and sisters, we are too anointed as priests, as princes, as princesses of his kingdom. We too are given the inheritance of every godly thing. But we must listen to the voice of Abigail speaking to us and immediately obey. That is where true restoration and eternal victory lies. I hope we experience this in our life. We all started out good, chosen by God, anointed like Saul and David. But how much different their life ends. One hears and one obeys. One hears and does not. That is all that makes the difference.